Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Super excited to be talking to Corey Wong today. My name is Jonah from Discover. And before we go any further, just want to make sure you all can hear and see us all right. Hop in the comments, let us know. Corey, if you can give a little hello, how are you doing today? Hi, everybody. I'm stoked to be here. Thanks for uh, thanks for hanging out. Hey, <laughs> I love, I just want to call out quick. I love already in the, in the comments, we got uh hi from Manchester, England, from North Carolina, oh, cool. Wyoming. And, uh, Anthony Garza here. I'm guessing everyone is holding a strat, Bill Jordan. No, he's got a telly. So we got, <laughs> we got all, all the right. right people with us here today. Tellies are accepted here. I, I got... I got a couple tellies in the back there, but uh, gotta... <laughs> I like that. San Francisco in the house. I'm going to be in there. I'm going to be in San Fran in a couple weeks. I'm looking forward to that. Well, uh, real quick, when's the tour start? Is it next week or? I, my tour start. I think the first show is November 3rd. Okay. So, awesome. Yeah, stoked about that. Is that the first tour since COVID or? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, that's all. Uh, yeah, I got a lot of energy just ready to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a whole other conversation I, oh man that's so exciting yeah um but it, i don't want to let's let's hop into this so i just want to do my little spiel set some sure. expectations yeah. uh for everyone watching Corey's gonna go through a lot of stuff today and i know you're all very excited to be here if you have to get up from the computer for a second or life interrupts you, don't worry, there will be a replay available. It'll be on this YouTube page, on the replay page, the event page, and it also will be emailed to you with the course offer. As I said, we are talking to Corey Wong today, and today the event is Become a Proficient Guitar Player, where Corey is going to break down his practice and reveal the techniques and tips you need to become a more creative and efficient musician. A little background on Corey if you don't know who he is. Corey plays guitar with Wolfpack, Fearless Flyers, and Corey Wong. You may also have seen him or heard him play with Ben Rector, Gene Simmons, Blake Shelton, Dave Barnes, Florida Georgia Line, Blind Boys of Alabama, Toby Mack. The list goes on. And he also has a podcast where he's interviewed a lot of his heroes like Joe Satriani, Pat Metheny, Vince Gill. It everything is the list could just go on i will say i'm a huge fan of Corey's. i followed his whole career and was super stoked when i saw it. not only that he was doing an event but that he was building a course where students could get more in-depth knowledge of how you think about the guitar Corey, because i think it's super unique all that said i don't want to take up any more time because <laughs> i want to dive into this so i'm going to hand it over to you yeah well thank you jonah uh, very kind words. I appreciate you saying those things. And I'm really excited to be here as well. Um, yeah, I've been kind of building this guitar course over the last year, I guess, um, on and off. And I just launched it. So I'm really excited about it. My main goal was to kind of show how I approach playing the guitar, how I approach practicing the guitar, what I think the important things are to learn the guitar. As far as if you're loosely interested in the type of style of playing that I do, but also just general, like how to just get good at the instrument. And there's some technical things and also just some kind of principled things and um, mindset things that I get into. But the other thing that I talk a lot about in my teaching and something that's really important to me is who you are as a creative person and who you are in your artistry and how to develop that. Not just can I play these scales? Can I play these patterns or shapes? But I think it's really important that people learn how to discover their own artistry, their own vision or voice on their instrument. And I like to talk about that sort of thing. So I'm going to dive a little bit. I'm going to get into the shallow end, into, into many of those things. And as I'm talking, I'll kind of glance over and look if, at the comments here. And if there is something that somebody's saying that I can uh, be more clear on, Please uh, feel free. And Jonah, if you need to step in and kind of uh, ask me to clarify something, totally fine to do that. Um, I have a new course. It's on Teachable. And a lot of what I do is rhythm guitar. So with rhythm guitar, 
you know, it's funny because so much of what people talk about with my playing is my right hand technique. That sort of thing. But there's so much left hand that kind of makes the right hand do what it does. So I'm going to give you kind of a short version of kind of how I think about my hands, how I approach practicing with each hand, and just some examples of how I go about playing what I do. So the main principle of rhythm guitar that I think about a lot is having the right hand like a motor. This sort of thing. Alternate strokes, one E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. And the interesting thing about that is that translates to other styles of music. So I go. And that same thing could alter to. So if you're watching my right hand there, my right hand is pretty much doing the same thing, just this. Now, of course, there's some little nuances of if I'm hitting the low strings, the middle or the high, and then some accenting in there. But really a lot of what is happening and a lot of what makes the groove feel the way that does is in the left hand. So I'm gonna talk about, just like I said, dive into the shallow end of this uh, that I go really deep in in the course. But on the right hand side of this sort of thing, learning to get your right hand motor going, to me is just like step one. Learn to get the control and play in time. For me, I play a lot with drum machines or metronomes or great musicians, that sort of thing. But learning how to just play and place something exactly on the beat like this. Now check this out. I'll play that exact thing and just comp an E7 chord or an E9 chord. And I'll show you the difference. I'll, I'll do the same thing with my right hand, but I'll change my left hand. Now check this out. That's obnoxious. I wanted to stop doing it three measures ago. So <laughs> the point that I'm trying to make is the left hand has so much to do with what's happening here. So although a lot of people like to talk about my right hand and ask about my right hand technique, so much equal attention should be paid to the left hand. So for me, in the left hand, anytime I'm thinking about a stroke, I'm thinking about, is it? So when I'm doing this sort of thing, I think about kind of, um, I guess I'll call it four things. I'll break it down into more in the course, but or I do break it down into more in the course, but for now I'll call it four things. I either think about hitting a chuck. I think about hitting a chord. I think about hitting a single note. Or I'll think about not hitting at all. <laughs> so one of the things that I like to do is practice for now. I'll show you. There's a, there's a whole accent gritting exercise in the course. Excuse me. But what I'll do is I'll just play chucks and I'll play chords on the downbeat. So that way I learn how to control my right hand or excuse me, my left hand. And for those of you that are watching that don't know the difference between a chuck and a chord, I'm just hitting kind of lightly muting the strings and then when I play the chord, I literally just press my fingers down to make the chord sound out. 
So on camera, it might look like I'm not changing anything, but if you look, I'm squeezing and then I'm letting go, squeezing, letting go and squeezing. So I'm just gonna squeeze on the downbeats of every measure. Now every beat. Now I'll do the a squeeze, I'll play the chord on the and of every beat. I switched it up at the end there. But that sort of thing, there's a whole exercise where I kind of shift the accents. It's like this. And I'm just learning to control the squeeze and learning to control what's happening with my left hand, but really just let this motor go. And I don't want to say brainlessly because I am concentrating on my timing and my execution, but really I'm just kind of letting this go into my, into, into my subconscious. And I'm really then just starting to focus more on the left hand. So, um, Another thing to do that I'll practice is I'll play a chord, chucks, and then I'll do a single note line. So check this out. I'll just make something up now. Now, what happens is if you're not playing super steady like i play very consistent and my attack sounds a certain way because of the way that i play so it kind of has this freight train thing going to it and if you're really consistent and if you can play steady time that works but now let's explore that fourth thing that i was talking about which is just don't hit the strings at all so on some of these i'm going to still do this Okay, that's the pattern-ish. I'll just sometimes not hit the strings and I'll show you how it, it feels different. Notice how I left that little gap in there and on its own, it might sound like it feels a little bit jerky or it feels like it hiccups. But what happens is in the context of a band, and hopefully many of you, most of you musicians are playing with others. If you're recording on things or if you're playing with other musicians, you sometimes need to leave space for them. Imagine that. And you hope that they leave space for you every once in a while too. But that's the thing for me that I'm always thinking about when I'm playing. So now we're going to get into mindset is, okay, I have these sort of rhythmic tools. If I'm just sitting on E7, I have my chucks, my chords, my single notes, and my rests. If I kind of decide that that's what I'm going to play, and I have the control when to hit those, how to hit those, I can keep my time steady. It actually allows me, once I have the full control physically over doing that, mentally, I can start to interact and pay more attention to what's happening around me. So if a bass player is playing something, starting to accent certain things, I can choose to go with them, or I can choose to do some sort of counter line. Either can be super fun, it's just what fits and what's maybe most appropriate for the moment. And if you're playing in a band where there's another band leader that's not you, then uh, fall in line with what they're looking for. That's, to me, my approach. So um, I mentioned something there physical execution before Perfect. i step in, yeah i see you i see you coming in here jonah I'll, i'm, I'm going to get to something in a second okay come at me uh sorry we had a very practical question and then just before we go in a different direction uh which a couple people seconded here which is in this picking style is there recommended plectrum thickness for this style so I'm, I see yeah, so a lot, yeah. there's a lot of different schools of thought. There's not necessarily, there's not a right or wrong answer, but while you asked, and I have a bunch of picks in front of me, 
I'm going to play with some different picks ah. and I'll let you be the judge. Now, oh, a bunch of them spilled. You know, it, as uh, as my, it does. You know, I can't, I literally just can't have a clean studio. Like I've done it. I've tried it, but it just doesn't work well for me to like, like this is, that, that looks all pretty organized. You know, it looks pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't see what's behind the camera. Right. Okay, I have a whole thing full of picks here. So what I use is these Dava picks. And actually, you know what? My, um, oh, can I comment in this or no? Yeah. Can I comment in the comments? I don't see a spot where I can comment. I can also. Okay. So check this out. I just have my own. Whenever I need to buy picks, I go to wong.com slash picks. It's just this short URL, URL that I made. It's wong with four O's. Wong.com slash picks. It's just like a, a short link that I made. For these Dava picks, um, they are rubber gripped. The tip of them is, so it's basically just like a regular, when I say regular pick, I mean like the kind of classic tall text pick, right? It's just like that, shape-wise, but it's got a little bit more of a point to it. The camera won't focus. It's got a little more of a point to it compared to the rounded tip. So I like it with a, a little more of a point. So I don't know if you can see. Um, but because it's rubber, it actually, the flex is a little bit more like a medium, but the tip, the, the plastic is, or whatever it's made out of, it's heavy. So I like the medium for the bend to be able to really be able to kind of have some flex in there, but I like the attack and the, the push of a heavy. So, um, before I give you examples, this is my preference. I know like Mark Lettieri is a good friend of mine. This is the pick that he uses this is one of his picks. It has his name on it. He uses it's like a heavy Dunlop tall text or something. Um, I know some people that use like these Dunlop nylons, which I'll show you that one in a second. Um, some people use these big pick. I'll, I'll just show you, but you know, there's not necessarily like I used to take lessons from John Harrington, the guitar player in Steely Dan, and he used to use a fender medium teardrop pick for anything that was strummy. And then he's the one that got me. This is his pick. He gave me this, this Dava. It's shaped like a jazz three pick. We're getting deep into picks now. I, I can't believe we've gotten here. This is a jazz three. It's the same size. That's the like Dava jazz three size. But I got hip. I accidentally, I accidentally ordered these bigger ones and fell in love with them. So um, John Harrington kind of got me hip to this, but he said he uses the Fender medium teardrop size for strumming and that sort of thing. And like when he's playing with Steely Dan, that sort of thing. But when he's playing lead, he uses the jazz three. Um, I was just doing a thing with Larry Carlton also who played with Steely Dan. He uses a fender teardrop pick, but it's thicker. It's like, it felt to me like between medium and heavy, but maybe it was a heavy um, because the teardrop, the shape, it, uh, it throws me off as far as like what the thickness is. But anyways, here is my pick. And then I will go through playing with an, a really light pick, a medium pick, a heavy pick, and a super heavy pick. Just, uh, I'll play the same thing that I've been doing. Okay, whatever. That's That's my pick. Here is a super light pick. Sorry, it like it was disorienting how much flex was in this. It's like holding a piece of paper. So I messed up. Sorry. What you don't know is that I'm kind of overcompensating. I'm digging in a little bit more. I'm choking up. So maybe I'm not giving you the most fair example. Here's like a Dunlop medium kind of light medium. Mm -hmm. 
actually really like that for this sound. Here's a heavy pick. This is what, like what Mark Lettieri uses. Now, Mark sounds better using these picks because he has a different technique than I do. So I, my technique sounds to me better on this pick. Mark's technique definitely sounds great on this, but here's the, like a heavy pick. Sounds a little too chunky for me. And here's one of these like gigantic picks just for. Also a little too chunky. Now I'll go back to what I use. Now to me, so much of it is feel, but. I also feel like for what I do in my technique style, the medium nylon and then this Dava pick sound the best. Um, is that, sorry, I can't hear you. Thank you for doing that. It's a little bit of a dive, but you can really hear the difference and I don't- Great, I'm glad you can tell. You get. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, especially when you're playing the same thing with the same style. It's really cool to hear how the impact on that. Yeah. yeah. Now that's kind of this style of thing. So check this out though. Let me show you, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the, the heavy pick and the, my regular pick. Now when I'm doing single note lines, that's my pick. Now here's, here's a heavy pick. Check this out. Uh. It kind of takes a little bit of the bite off the top end. Right. So some of that has to do with the pick, that heavier pick has a little more rounded edge, but it's also, it's just got a little more surface area and it's just got a little more of a rounded thing. So sometimes like one example that you can hear, I pretty much always use this Dava pick, but um, I'm trying to think what was on my last album, Corey Wong and Dirty Loops. We did an a collaborative album together. Um, there's a song called Ring of Saturn. And on the bridge, it's got this kind of Pat Metheny sort of soaring singing guitar line. And I wanted it to still feel like a Stratocaster, but because mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's like my part of my sound, right? It's it's my sound. Right. Um, but I wanted it to have a little more of, of that kind of Metheny sound that's in my head all the time because I love Pat. So I used a thick pick and that literally just changing the pick kind of helped do that. I changed a couple tiny things, my guitar settings, but really the pick is what helped take some of that bite off and round out that sound. Huh. So kind of the, that's the, that's just like the, here's the whatever, here's the answer to your question. Now, the real answer to that question, again, I go deep into this sort of thing in the course. The thing that, that really matters is what does it actually sound like? when you like what like okay you heard what it sounds like but let's let's try to place some more tangible things on what it sounds like so for me when i play my really percussive rhythmic style i'm thinking about so obviously i have the notes you hear the now if you were just go or oh, sorry Like that's the notes you hear, right. whatever. Like that, that's, you know, a, a dumbed down version of kind of what that feels and sounds like. But what some people don't realize is that the guitar is able to be that kind of like, pretend a piano is playing that da da ba ba da ba ba da ba da ba ba da ba ba da in one hand. And then in the other hand, they've got a shaker or they've got, right. or a hi-hat or something. So for me, as while I'm listening to, So with different picks, you can think of things like, uh, does this sound more like an egg shaker? Does this sound more like a metal shaker? Not like a heavy metal shaker. Who uses a shaker in a heavy metal band? But uh, <laughs> like like a shaker, like with right. a metal. <laughs> that although that that would be like an awesome it job. Could be, yeah. <laughs> I'm, 
<laughs> I'm the guy who plays Shaker on all the all the thrash metal album. Like I'm the session Person. guy for yeah, whatever. Okay, so like <laughs> there's an egg shaker, which sounds different than a metal shaker, which sounds different than like uh some people like put rice in a in like a like a cardboard sort of box thing that right. sounds different than playing a hi-hat which sounds different than tambourine but they're all these things that go right so when i'm playing with these different picks and when i'm playing different styles and on different strings i'm thinking uh, about that so that's me that's got a little more weight to it that's got less weight. Now check out the really thin pick. It's got, it's got a little more to it. And if I go with this, it's more like the, it's like you've got 16 inch hi-hats all of a sudden with the heavy pick, you know? Right, so right. I've gone from 16 inch hi-hats with the heavy pick to all of a sudden just a regular 14 inch hi-hat. And each can serve a different purpose. So to answer your question, I've gone through and showed you what I've used and, and some different examples. But I think in the end, really what it comes down to is what is the preference and artistically, what are you trying to do or say with your music? In my case, I like 14 inch hi-hats. I like the sound of this pick and the, the amount of percussiveness and the amount of girth and body that it has to it with the rather than you know the big 16 inch or like sloshy hi-hats or something you know? but it but it sounds like you're not you're cognizant of the different tools available to you and you're willing to change if it suits the like the situation like i've encountered a lot of guitarists who like treat their pick <laughs> like it's part of their identity like i use only this yeah, that, it sounds like you're more flexible in that you have your sound, but you've used other things when it's appropriate. Yes, I would say 97% of the time I use the Dava pair. Fair. But Fair. what I'll do is I'll I, I end up making changes more just like when you're playing on 14 inch hi-hats, you can hold them really tight. You can loosen them a little bit. You can use the meat of your stick or you can use the tip of your stick to get different sounds. You can play different strings, play different types of attack, even just going from. Right. You know, there's different sounds that you can get even within the same pick. So for me, yes, if I need to use a different pick for a certain job, totally fine. Different guitar, different pedals, different amps, that's fine. In the end, like when you pull up Spotify and listen to my music, the type of pick doesn't matter. What matters <laughs> is, well, what, what matters is how does it feel when you right. listen to my guitar playing? And I need to make, like you're saying, I need to be cognizant of what I'm doing and how it's going to affect the way that you feel. Right. Not, not just from a time feel standpoint, but from tone, from attack, how the transient attacks and decays, you know, we can get so far deep into it. And I guess we already are, but, right. um, <laughs> you know, that like that sort of thing to me, it's the sort of thing that you should pay attention to, not for the sake of, Oh, like I'm going to use the same picks as Pat Metheny. It's, Ooh, that sound gives a certain feeling. That sound has mm. a certain type of thing. I want that sound. And this can help me get that sound. I love that. Well, and so not to get off picks, but maybe also yes to get off picks a little bit to cover. We yeah. had uh, we had a few questions that leak into kind of what I was curious about. I'm looking as at him, well, yeah. uh, which uh, Will was asking. He was saying when he mutes the strings with his left hand, he often gets harmonics. How do you avoid that? And also a kind of follow up, which is, do you mute the strings with your left hand? or play them with your right. So where does that definition when you're doing the individual note stuff, but still just rocking your right hand from? Uh, both Will and Joe, great questions. Um, well, I'm gonna answer them both separately, but I'm just kind of thinking how to, how to attack that. The harmonics one, 
Like if I'm playing a B minor chord. I'm getting some of those harmonics in there, but I don't really care, right? Because those are part, those are part of the chord. But if I don't want those harmonics in there, what I'll do is I'll end up kind of just, so instead of leaving this finger here, sometimes I'll, See, listen for this. Listen for those. It sounds bad when I just stick on it. It's kind of the passing thing. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of shift up by a half step sometimes for the chuck. But uh, a lot of times, like an E minor, that one's pretty obvious a lot. So sometimes I'll just kind of move away a half step. So I'm not, like, I am keeping the same chord shape. Like if you want to do an E minor seven, right? Uh, e minor seven here. If I just stay right there, you're going to get a lot of the harmonics. As opposed to... Uh, So sometimes like right there, I'm just putting, I'm putting my ring finger down. So you're not hearing the harmonics, you're just hearing the chucks. That's kind of my approach to that. Um, so just kind of sliding. You're always just one fret away from not having a harmonic. So sometimes I'll just kind of sidestep the chucks uh, and kind of think of them as their own like safe, haven away from notes. <laughs> um, uh, let me look back at Joe's. Oh, Joe asks, uh, do I mute the strings with my left hand or not play them with my right? It's totally different. So let me show you the difference. Um, I'll play a line. Right? That's me muting them with my left hand. Now I'll take out the chucks. You know, so that's just me moving my hand away. I'm trying to be really obvious with it, but uh, I'll try. So I'll try to make it so you can see a little better. You know, so that so it's two different things as opposed to. Does that make sense? Um, they're just two different things. Yeah, that's really helpful uh, and helps demystify a little bit like what's going on when you go in between the like chords and the single sure. notes. Yeah. Uh, last one I wanted to touch, uh, but I think it gets back on track to kind of where right. we were before we went into uh, into picks and everything, which was awesome. But uh, Augustine Marengo asks, in a band, how would you handle it when someone or everyone is rushing or dragging? And right before we went into that, you were starting to talk about what's appropriate to play yeah. with others. So yeah, is that a good place to jump back into that? Great, that's fine. Um, to me, it sounds like what you are talking about is, now there's two different things. There's time execution and there's time feel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll give you halfway between the shallow and the deep end on this. I go in the deep end in my guitar course. What you're talking about is two different things, time execution and time feel. 
Uh, actually, no, you're talking about time execution. I think there's time feel that should be considered. And then within each of those, there's mental awareness and there's physical execution. Okay, I'm going to break that down. Time, ex time execution is just like, are you able to play in time? Right? Time feel is, here's the time. I'm choosing to kind of place things a little bit ahead of the beat, a little bit behind the beat, maybe right on the beat. Now, some people say that music recorded to a metronome or a click is lifeless. I would say that the people that play music that sounds lifeless play lifeless. Very simple. A lot of the best feeling music in the world has been recorded to a metronome. I liken it to bumper bowling. Okay? You've got the grid straight down the middle. Let's say you throw the ball. You're, you're bowling. You throw the ball straight down the middle of the lane. It's just going to go right down the middle. You might get a strike. You might not. I don't know. I like, I don't really bowl. Um, but when you're bumper bowling, you have bumpers on either side that are going to prevent your ball from going off the edge into the gutter, right? I approach playing to a click like bumper bowling. Now I am a professional guitar player who is, who I have very good time. My time feel and my time execution is great. Am I arrogant for saying that? No, it's just something that I've worked on for like 20 some years. So of course, if I've spent this much time, I'm gonna do that. Like to say that you're good at something if you are. Just like a professional bowler does not really need the gutters or like, or like the bumpers to cover the gutters, now, that being said, sometimes I get excited when there's like a huge gig or whatever. I'm, we're not going to get into that. Pretend that the grid is just bumper bowling. For me, I can stay in time just fine. You know what else I can do? I can make the ball curve from left to right. I can throw it straight and then have it curve right at the end, figuratively speaking, musically, within the grid. Okay, so to me, what's appropriate is like that bowling lane where something right down the middle is good. Now, if you're throwing gutter balls to the right all the time, you're dragging. If you're throwing them gutter balls to the left all the time, you're rushing. Okay? To me, time, time execution, what well, you're asking if somebody's rushing or dragging all the time, you got to just get them to not throw gutter balls. Now, time feel is a different thing where you can kind of weave in and out of where that ball goes down the bowling lane. Because to me, there's an acceptable amount of ahead of the beat, on the beat, and behind the beat, right? You throw the ball, you could throw from the left to the right, and you're still gonna get a strike. You could throw straight on and get a strike. You could throw right to left and get a strike. I'm not a pro bowler. Don't come at me if you got some sort of science with it. Look, I've seen it happen all three ways. Same thing in music, right? You can rush and it can feel good. You can play in time and you can feel good. You can play a little bit behind the beat and it can feel good, right? So what I would suggest is with your band, practice along to a metronome and just see where things are at. Can people play in time? Now, oftentimes somebody's time feel gets misconstrued for dragging. Now I've played with drummers where, where I'm doing kind of this thing like I was just playing. If I'm playing that sort of thing and a drummer is kind of laying back the back beats, that just feels like dragging to me. Although they're just saying like, oh, I'm playing in time, I'm just laying back. But to me, like I'm trying to, I'm a, I'm trying to be this freight train plowing forward right now with the time and with the rhythm. Now I'm not rushing, I'm playing in time, right on the time. And I'm trying to really, and like, so I approach things very metronomic, but my attack makes it feel aggressive and, and, and forward momentum. So even though the time is steady, all these other things contribute to it feeling like it has forward momentum. Because of that, if a drummer is laying back their snare too much, 
to me, the feel is completely off. Cause it's like, no, like, why are you putting on the brakes? We're all trying to push forward right now. So sometimes what you have to consider is what's appropriate for a certain song. What are certain people's proclivities to the way they like things to feel? or what their just internal time feel is in general. But I always like to say like, there's certain music that should have an, if, if there's angsty punk rock music, it shouldn't, you shouldn't lay back. Like it should feel like it's got some angst to it. If something feels like it just needs to be, I don't feel like it should nudge from that. Like if it just feel, if it needs to feel like it's very straight down the middle, it should just all feel straight down the middle. Now, if you want something to feel like, oh, laid back, chilling, relaxed, you don't rush that. You got to kind of make the time feel reflect the emotion that you're trying to portray. So there's a lot to, that we could talk about in your question about your bandmates rushing or dragging. Also consider time feel. And now if you're asking how can you help your bandmates practice not rushing or dragging or practice their time feel? Let's dive into that right now. The way that I think about it, like I was saying, is there's, there's time execution and there's time feel. And within both of those things, I think there's mental awareness of them and then there's execution of them. Okay, so for me, I have both high mental awareness and high execution for timing on the guitar because I've done it for a lot of years. Now, if you were to give me a cello and ask me to play, my mental awareness of the timing would still be the exact same, but my execution would struggle. The opposite is true for a lot of people where they have tons of technical facility. Maybe they're go maybe they sound like you know they're like like they can play it's like clearly they're playing fast and they have like it's like uh you're playing fast and I guess it's technically proficient but it sounds sloppy and it's not really in time. So in that case, the execution might be there, but the mental awareness and control, the mental control of that is not there. So in my guitar course, I have a few different exercises for practicing the mental awareness side and a handful of exercises that focus on just the physical execution side. But really the place to start with all of this is just an understanding that there's a difference between mental awareness and physical execution on your instrument. I don't quite have all the time to go into those, but they're in the course, handful of different exercises of that, which I guess apply to, to any instrument. But for your bandmates, that would be something that I would try to start figuring out, trying to solve. If it's more of a mental awareness of the time, are they just not paying attention? Are they not able to lock in or is it that they're um they just don't have the facility on their instrument yet hope that answers your question thank, thank you so much Corey. and i if i can tag without going too much into the weeds but just a little advice because it's my experience ad addressing other musicians time mm. can be <laughs> And uh, a ego bumping situation. Yeah. And do you have any more just like, I, I guess it's almost psychological advice or how to, how to work with your bandmates to all, ideally everyone's trying to get better. But when you encounter that, do you, from your experience? I will only anything? speak into the time feel one because that's the one that I run into more. Mm-hmm. That's the one that I can speak into. And you can maybe um, expand on that as far as like, can somebody actually play in time or not? Because nowadays, the musicians that I play with are all, I mean, pretty much everybody's a professional musician and like basically A-list at what they do. 
Um, do they always have the best chops in the world? No, but are they like that? That's the thing. Like, just because you have great chops doesn't mean that you're a great guitar player or a great. Well, hmm. Let me be careful how I say that. Just because I'll say it this way: just because you have great chops does not mean that you're a great artist. Sure. Right. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have more creative value or input than somebody who has less chops than you on an instrument. Right. So. Everybody I play with is is a list. They understand and can play in time. It wasn't always that way, but the situations that I run into now, those sort of conversations, like we're talking about now, more are about time feel and about preference. So, I think in general, when you're talking to bandmates about things that, for me, like um, there, I have different situations where I, sometimes I'm hired as a side man for a session for some. Mm -hmm big artist or whatever. Um, sometimes I'm, uh, I'm the band leader in the band, Corey Wong. Imagine that I am the band leader <laughs> or as a, as a band member in fearless flyers and Wolfpack, you know, my role is very different, but when I'm band leader, I have to kind of get the vision happening, get everybody coordinated, right? Making those 1% 3% tweaks that all of a sudden whoo, make a hundred percent difference in what, in that it all comes down to my preferences. It's not when I'm playing this sort of thing and somebody's playing the drums a little behind the beat. Now it would kind of be wrong of me to say, Hey, like you're dragging that. Can you not drag that? Um, because that's, something like I'm personally it's like, Hey, you're doing something wrong. The way that you play, the way that you feel time is bad. That's how they're going to interpret that typically. Right. And like you're saying, that can be a huge blow to the ego. Then it can create a rift. Another way to do it is, Hey, my preference is that this really drives forward. Can you play more on the beat or just like right on top of the beat? I want to have everything just kind of driving and nothing feel like it's pulling back on this. Or, you know, in certain cases where I'm, I might be playing a groove that's. one i want to feel a little more laid back so i might say like hey on that one my preference is that we kind of play and get a little bit lazy with the time and we can let that one lay back and feel more relaxed so it's not hey you're rushing it's my preference is for it to be this my preference is for things to be kind of um dry and tight and then on the chorus have it i, I would prefer if things kind of opened up and kind of felt like they wash out a little bit you know, because that way you're explaining what your preference is rather than what they're doing wrong. In the same way that like nobody can argue, like, because you could argue, like, I'm not, I'm not dragging. I'm playing in right. time. Like, listen, we're playing right. along to the click. It's like, yeah, we're all playing to the click. But like, you're hugging the right gutter and I'm trying to be on the left gutter. You know, like we're all over on the left side of the bowling lane and you're over here like whatever that like so something like it's the same thing as like my preference is this or you know um just in life in general it's like when you say these sort of things this is how i feel right <laughs> you know like when you say this i feel this nobody can dispute what you feel but if you say like you're attacking me with blah, 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 blah. It's like, oh, I wasn't intending on attacking you. Like, I just was like saying something. I don't know. You know, we don't have to get into that. But, no. you know, preferences, that's more the way to talk about it rather than telling somebody they're doing something wrong. Appreciate it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love that. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. If you had some other things you wanted to touch on, I definitely wanted to ask you a couple questions uh, about your course. But yeah. were there some were there some things you wanted to vibe into, or should I? Should no, I, I think we in? I think we yeah. covered some really great stuff here. Yeah. Uh, so 
the course, I think first thing people would wonder is, is it a beginning guitar course where mm -hmm. if you've been playing for a while, what is it like, where should you be in your playing if they're popping into this course? Yeah. So the people who are going to benefit the absolute most from this course are those who have some level of understanding of their instrument and can play some songs already. This isn't for the type, this isn't necessarily for the person that's That's great right. wherever you're at on that. But once you can kind of get like, you know, get a little more comfortable playing some songs, really that's kind of all you need. Now, it's going to be hard for you. I would say kind of the level just before intermediate all mm -hmm. the way up through expert is is the best way the best person to to take advantage of this now the reason why i say it's that's such a gap is because for the expert for the advanced player they're going to see literally exactly what i do for my practice routines for my warm-ups for my the way that i think about music you're going to see some of my I'm going to break down some of my kind of signature moves, that sort of thing. The intermediate player is going to get a lot of, and, and you know, the intermediate and below player also is just going to get so much from these exercises and the structure of the way that I look at music, look at the guitar, look at artistry. And even those that are, that are, uh, that don't know as much are, are less familiar with the guitar. There's a whole section on the principles of practice mm. where I talk about, how to practice what you do to get the most mileage out of out of your practice and to get more efficient practice so you know where you might have spent 45 minutes on working on sort of some sort of thing my goal is to help you get those same results in 15 minutes and right. i'm going to give you an ex i'm going to give you some there's three different workshops where you go to like all right here's these three videos that are literally 1 hour long this is what I do when I sit down to practice. Mm. Here's how I structure them. Now, these particular blocks, you might not be able to play these exact things right out of the gate, but mark down what I'm working on in each of those blocks and then apply that to what you're working on at the time. And then you apply that with everything else. So it really is a great comprehensive course for really somebody who has somewhat of a, uh, an understanding of just being able to play songs on the guitar through advanced players. That's cool though. So it does, it's not just like what notes to play. It's also just the structure of how to get better. Yes, absolutely. Well. How to get yeah. better, how to take, like, here's some gaps that are often left in guitar players. There's so many, even advanced guitar players. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to say this. He's one of my best friends, Theo Katzman from Wolfpack, the other mm -hmm. my, my bandmate in Wolfpack, one of the best musicians on the planet. An incredible guitar player. But we were, he was watching me warm up one day. He's like, What are you doing? And I was doing this um, three octave <laughs> arpeggio. Kind of going through the circle of fits, major and minor, uh, three octave triads. He's like, Whoa, dude, that's cool. So I was teaching him that. And then I could see him kind of filling in a lot of the gaps of like, he can clearly play all this stuff, but I could see that it was structured in a way where now all of a sudden he was forced to find different anchor points on the neck and uh -huh. build melodic structures from them. So like, even though he's a, a highly advanced player, when I showed him some of these exercises that are in my course, I could see him just like, Oh my gosh, dude. Yeah. I got to get my Wong exercises down, you know? And then like <laughs> six shows down the road in the tour, he's like, dude, check it out. Like, you know, and then he's blazing through it. And, you know, he's, <laughs> but it was, it's fun to just see like, even advanced players, I've seen a lot of gaps or voids in just certain types of ways to look at the neck, how to use every part of the neck as an anchor point for building melodic structures, building scales, chords, triads, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. Love it. And, and it's a very practical question, which uh, Silvo, Silvio asked twice, so I just want to cover it. Can you pay for the course in installments or is it just a one time? I know for this Discover event, you're offering its uh, discounted price. So it's $175 for a week. 
But if you go and buy the course at another point on your course page, do you have an installment option or just a one-time fee? I'm not sure if Teachable has that option on their end with their site, but typically it would just be a, you just, it's a one-time payment thing. And the thing, so I had a lot of people ask about doing a subscription sort of thing. My, or like, oh yeah, like, why don't you do a subscription model and just whatever. My personal preference, because I bought dozens of guitar courses just to kind of see what other people are doing, kind of see how structures of courses are and that sort of thing. What I noticed with a lot of the subscription-based things is the real course is like the first three months of videos. And then and it's then like, kinda like <laughs> a bunch of extra stuff where it's like, oh, like the stuff that I really need to know from you is the first three months of videos. So for me, I sure. didn't want it to feel that way. I want it to be like, this is the course. And what I will end up doing is I'm going to keep adding more material as months go on. And you're just going to kind of get that material for free if you already have the course. And honestly, the course price will probably just continue to go up as I add more stuff. But once you get the course, you just have lifetime access to it. So I don't know if Teachable is offering any sort of payment plans right now, but I think it's just a one-time payment right now. But it sounds like a good time to get into it, though, if it's expanding yeah. in the future. Yeah. 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 I already have a bunch of lessons that I've been starting to record and uh, outline and that sort of thing. Cool. Uh, just to be cognizant of time here, we had one more really solid non-music related question. Sure. Um, which was from Max, what's your favorite Hot Pocket flavor? Wow, you Max, you really put me on the spot here. <laughs> um, I have not had a Hot Pocket in 20 years. Solid. I um, think that answer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now I, I got nothing against hot. I got nothing against the brand. Okay. I, yeah, I, I'm not, I got nothing against you, Max. I'm not saying anything about your lifestyle. <laughs> My preference is to <laughs> eat a little bit of a cleaner diet. <laughs> we're, we're practicing the preference language. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, I, I want to be cognizant of your time and appreciate you going into some of these deep dives. Um, I, I do know there were a couple questions uh, that we didn't get to because I know they're just rabbit holes like, what kind of channel strip do you use? Sure. Stuff like that. Uh, I know you have a YouTube and stuff. Are there some places where people can go to learn more about like more of your gear and that side of what you do? Yep. There's some, uh, I have a whole YouTube series called on the one where I break down like a lot of my production, um, techniques and I just go through isolating tracks on my songs and talk you through the tracks and what I used on them. Um, but also, when you sign up for my guitar course, we have our own Discord server. And mm -hmm. in that, there's different sections. And I pop in there and we'll talk about what gear I'm using. I will answer a lot of these kind of questions. And um, yeah, like just two days ago, I was like, here's all the gear that I'm using right now. Here's my favorite <laughs> stuff. And people had questions about it. And I was doing that. So in the Discord server for the course, um, I'll answer some of those kind of questions. But some of those are longer winded answers. So you can see on my YouTube page or in the discord server of the course. Cool. Cool. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So there's a whole, uh, yeah. whole place to have a little more interaction there. That's super yep. cool. Um, well, uh, uh, Corey, did you have anything else you wanted to touch on? Well, I just wanted to say thanks for, for everybody yeah. joining. Uh, for those of you that are not in the guitar course, I really encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm really proud of it. I know and guarantee that, if you go through all the material, you will be a better and more precise guitar player. And hopefully it will also uh, teach you to weave your artistry and your own personal creativity into your guitar playing and your musicianship as well. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Corey. And for everyone watching, be 100% clear. The link for the course is in the comments. It's pinned there. It will be emailed to you as well. And you can access it for the discount price for a week, but it will always be available on the Discover page. And uh, Corey, can you call out your page as well where the course is? 
Uh, yeah, you can go to CoreyWongMusic.com. That's my website, and there's it'll take you right to my course if you want. Love it. And for everyone watching as well, if you like this video and enjoyed it as much as I did, please like and subscribe to the Discover channel. We're trying to bring more creators like Corey who are offering their expertise out here to share with us. And one last little question I have, I like to wrap up with Corey before we call it quits. For, for that intermediate guitarist who's, who's reached that kind of point where maybe they have their style, the way they play, but they still are just trying to break that barrier of what else is possible. Mm -hmm. Do you have just a little bit of advice? I know that's a big question, but a little bit of advice before we part for people who are on that journey who might be diving into this course. Yeah, that is a question. Typically that question is something along the lines of when I'm soloing or when I'm playing chords or when I'm, coming up with parts, I feel boxed in. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a lot of people say they're boxed into the pentatonic shapes. They're boxed into certain chord shapes on the guitar. And these are very specific things that I address in the workshops and in the individual videos, on the shorter videos on my course, is teaching you how to break out of those boxes by finding all of the anchor points on the neck, by having mm. an understanding. Like when somebody says, play a C on every string. You can go and you just know where all the C's are. It's like, okay, if you can't do that, how do you think you're gonna have really good anchor points? So I, I go through that and then I learn then, so we're gonna start there. If you don't get it, fine, we're gonna slowly get there. And then we learn to build chords mm -hmm. and triads and scales off of every one of those anchor points. And then we learn those, a lot of, a lot of guitar players learn things in a box, like G minor pentatonic. Mm -hmm. It's very vertical like this. So what I do in my course is I also get you to practice things horizontally. I show mm. you specific examples, horizontal movement, and then finding the anchor points within that. Diagonal motion this way, diagonal motion this way. And what ends up happening is because there's so many anchor points, because you have your vertical and your horizontal motion on the fretboard, all of a sudden, instead of the fretboard looking like this, and then this, and then this, it all of a sudden just looks like this in your mm. mind. And that's really the place for full fretboard freedom. <laughs> uh, that's not one of my taglines. I that somebody else has probably said no. that. It's, like, it's probably like trademarked at this point, you know. Like, it just sounds well, like some double sort of check. Yeah. yeah, that's that's been trademarked that I'm gonna get sued for. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's I stand by that. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you, Corey, so much for your time and for taking these dives with us. For of everyone watch you, watching, thank you so much for being here. Please hop in the chat. Thank Corey. Let us know something you learned. We come back and love to read those comments. And yeah. we'll see you all soon. Corey, thank you. Thanks. I uh, hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you soon. You too. Peace. Peace.